It's uh, fun to be here. It's been quite a build-up to this, so here we are, and this is the moment. Um, a radio telescope such as we see on the screen, the CAT7 array radio telescope in the crew, for me is a magical device. It's something that sits on the shores of the universe. It listens very quietly, pointing up at the sky and listening for signals that we can't even detect with our senses. We're listening for radio signals um, beyond the realm of the normal sort of five human senses. And to me, this is what captures my, my imagination, and it's why I got involved with the Square Kilometre Array South Africa project around about 2004, and what's kept me going ever since. So the galaxy, as you know, and the universe is a magnificent place. With our telescopes, we can look out beyond our own galaxy and see other galaxies. So this is one called the Sombrero Galaxy. It's uh, something like 30 million light years away, which means that the light has taken 30 million years to get to us. The sort of stars and things that you can see on the, on the slide are in the foreground. It's the galaxies behind it in the background. That, that wonderful, kind of beautiful uh, haze that you can see is not uh, gas or sort of dust. It's actually stars. There's something like 100 billion stars in this galaxy. And there's a beautiful uh, lane of dust going around it, which gives it that, that sort of brim of the sombrero, and uh, hence the, the name Sombrero Galaxy. This is a picture, one of the deepest ones ever made, uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. It was compiled over many years, but something like the equivalent of 23 days of, of kind of open shutter exposure. And it shows what you get when you look at the, some of the darkest pieces of the universe and then do a very long time exposure. And what we see is just a field of, of galaxies. Almost everything in that picture is a galaxy. So within the sort of visible universe, there's something like 100 billion galaxies, each with 100 billion stars. What's even more amazing to me, and I sort of stumbled across this on Wikipedia recently, is we're starting to find planets so regularly now within our own galaxy that there's something probably like 100 billion planets in our own galaxy to go with 100 billion stars, sort of on average. So that's a lot of planets, a lot of potential for other things to be happening. All right, you can also look at the universe at a very small scale. You can get into your garden, you can smell the flowers, you can take a photo of a bee. You could be on the beach and it could be something really simple, just a piece of seaweed lying there, nothing complicated, but somehow it just sort of uh, resonates with your soul and it gives you a feeling that there's, there's more to this universe than just objects and things. There's something actually that drives human exploration. So all of us here today, we're sitting, we come to the TEDx event, we probably come for some reason. And the reason is that we want to develop ourselves, learn a bit more, maybe expand our horizons and explore. This somehow is in tune with our deepest nature. So when we do this, we find that it invigorates us, we come away with excitement, we're learning new things. So when you're in tune with your deepest nature, uh, you might look something like this. This is uh, uh, one of my colleagues from the, the, my, my office. Um, he gave me permission to, to, give, to show this picture. Um, he's, he's the one on the right, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So if we're going to really understand the universe and, and sort of really see what's happening, we have to observe it very clearly. So we use instruments like telescopes to sort of look outward, but we also have to use our own five senses to do this. So as you know, you've got uh, the sense of sight, um, touch, taste, smell, hearing. So let's actually practice that now. So I'd like to challenge you, this is very complicated. What we're gonna do is connect with our senses, okay? The five physical senses. We've of course also got heart and mind with which we sort of feel and infer. But right now, let's try and connect to uh, one of our five senses. And even more scary, I'm going to ask you, if you would like to, to close your eyes. You don't have to do that. It's in a big audience, and someone might see you closing your eyes. But I'm going to close my eyes. <laughs> okay, so simply just sort of feel where you are in your chair. Uh, get in tune with your body. And really get a feel of the sense of your body sitting in the chair. Thank you. What you've just done is made a direct observation of the universe. It's not through your mind, it's not through this chatter that goes on, it's a direct observation. You've actually connected to your senses. It turns out that our mind often gets in the way, and the same bit of the mind that is thinking about stuff, turning around thoughts, the discursive mind, is the same part of the mind that connects with the senses. 
So when you connect with your senses, you're actually present. When you're connected with a thought pattern in your mind, you're not present. So you're not really seeing the universe as it is. All right, so we can look at the universe in many different ways. We can look at uh, optical light. We can look up and see a myriad of stars swirling in the night sky. We can look also at infrared. So this is the Horsehead Nebula um, shown at infrared light. And for me, a really beautiful picture. It somehow sort of stands out and, and glows. Magnificent object. It's uh, visible in the southern sky if you had infrared eyes. <laughs> Okay, this is a, a galaxy called Centaurus A. Once again, a beautiful picture. All that fuzz around there is also stars. Um, the, the, the other sort of more distinct stars are in the four once again. And the universe is very showy. It likes to show itself at visible light, but it's quite a kind of likes to show off a bit. So I'll show myself at infrared. I'll show myself at radio waves. I'll show myself at x-rays. So then the question is, well, what is the, the correct picture of the universe? So if we add x-rays and radio to this picture, then we can see that this galaxy actually looks a little bit different. In the middle of that galaxy is a supermassive black hole, uh, something like 100 million t uh, times the mass of our own sun. And it sh as the matter is falling into that black hole, some of it goes in, and some of it actually shoots out in jets, roughly at about the speed of light, moving out again from the black hole. And with a radio telescope, which shows up in orange in this picture, we can actually see those jets. The sort of blue parts, I hope you can see from there, uh, there's a bit of a blue towards the edge, is the, the X-ray part of this picture. So what a, a telescope does is really transfer things from outside the realm of your senses, and remember we practiced connecting to our senses a moment ago, to, to something that's inside the realm of our senses. So it's really a kind of a translation device. These are um, sort of data collected by the CAT7 radio telescope in the crew, and you can present these, uh, the, this information to scientists as pictures, as graphs, as, as plots, etc. Right, the SKA telescope is going to be the world's biggest and most sensitive radio telescope. It's going to take quite a long time to build. We're building a first phase now called Meerkat, which will be ready in 2016, uh, with 64 dishes. That's a kind of a precursor phase built by South Africa. Then the next phase is phase one, which will be around about 2020 of the SKA, a kind of 10% version. Um, something like, in South Africa, something like 250 dishes or so, up in the Karoo region. And then round about 2025, the time scale is still to be negotiated, the full array spreading out over Africa with something like 2,500 dishes. Some of the science that the SK do, will do is completely groundbreaking. We are looking at why the universe is expanding more quickly than we think it should be. It turns out the universe is, acceleration, is accelerating in later times, and we call this dark energy, and we're not sure why that, why that is. It's a bit embarrassing for cosmologists at the moment, actually. And <laughs> There's another big part of the universe called dark energy, uh, sorry, dark matter, uh, which is sort of extra matter that's associated with galaxies, and we also don't know what that is, so we give it this very technical term, dark matter. We're also going to look for, uh, to test sort of fundamental theories of gravity, uh, look for life, uh, the, the building blocks of life, and maybe even life itself. So try and answer the questions, are we alone? So this array will be a very vast thing. This is kind of what, what it'll look like in the core of the array. Um, a very large number of dishes. This is an artist impression of the SKA. That's how it will spread across Africa, so you can see a lot of stations, a concentration in the Northern Cape, and then uh, spread out in stations across Africa, up to Ghana, Kenya. Uh, the favorite station is in Mauritius, for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Meerkat antenna, so the thing we're building now, in uh, early 2014, the first couple of dishes will be on site and testing, and as I say, we'll build out to 64 dishes. There's a man at the bottom there for, for scale. Um, okay, so what happens with a radio telescope? Now, I'd like you to kind of almost feel this now, rather than understand it in a way. So, imagine that you're there in the core of this whole array. The signals are streaming in from space. Some of them have come in extremely weak signals, which is why you need so many dishes. And some of them have come in from space, maybe traveling, you know, 10 billion years or so. Extremely weak signals are coming in. So, as they come in, they bounce off these dishes, they reflect up to the sort of secondary reflector and then get collected by the feed system. There they're sort of amplified by a very cold piece of electronics running at about sort of minus 240 uh, degrees Celsius, so it's kind of fairly close to, to absolute zero to reduce the noise in the system. And then they get sort of digitized and sent back to a supercomputer. So just to sort of run through that all again, you're standing there, signals streaming in from space, uh, converted to, to digitized signals, streaming back by vast sort of fiber optic pipes 
across the continent, back to a huge central supercomputer, lights flashing, software kind of running, and eventually out pops an answer. And the scientist kind of looks at it and goes, hmm, that's, that's odd. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's a lot of opportunities uh, created with this telescope. The government has made a very strong national program that's uh, supporting the Square Kilometre Array project. We're putting a lot of money into it. And it's not just to do that kind of science where the scientist goes, oh, that's odd, okay. Um, there's many, many benefits that come from investing in, in such technologies. We are training up a lot of very uh, bright and capable uh, young people within the country. You can see some of them in the picture there. Doing things from like bricklaying, connecting fiber optic cables to designing feeds for the telescope, doing the fundamental science. So a whole range of things. Many businesses are engaging with us, trying to um, kind of use the SK as a, a trigger point into Africa, developing new technologies, new programs. It really is a trigger point for growth in the country, replacing some of the industries we may have had in the past, like the arms industry and the petrochemicals, where we put a lot of emphasis in the past. So radio astronomy is a very nice, benign science, which can engage with people. All right, so now just sort of bringing it back to this idea of observing the universe. To really observe the universe, you've got to be quite still. Your instruments have to be really still. And you can see from the vastness of this landscape that we're putting it in the, in the Karoo, very few people. And the reason we put it out there and go to such expense is to reduce the radio noise. We don't want people with microwave ovens and cell phones and other things in the area because they actually blind the telescope. So in the same way as we sit here in the audience, we can also get blinded by our own sort of internal things. If we're caught up in a thought process, if we're worried about something, if our sort of heart isn't clear, the mind's not open. So really what the, the sort of message of this talk is, to me, the most exciting thing about life is an exploration. It's an exploration both outward, and I'm in a job that does that, so that's fantastic. But it's also an exploration that goes inward. So T.S. Eliot sums this up quite well. Uh, we shall not cease from exploration, and at the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. Now that's, that's quite a, a deep statement. It means you're looking outwards, you're looking inwards, and somehow when you look inwards, you're seeing things from a, a fresh perspective. And that's certainly been my own personal experience. Another quote, when you do this exploration of the universe, you can't be greedy. You can be greedy, but you're not going to get very far. <laughs> okay. So the sea does not reward those who are too anxious, too greedy, or too impatient. One should lie empty, open, choiceless as a beach, waiting for a gift from the sea. And a radio telescope array kind of reminds me of that. So in the same way, in our own lives and in our own hearts, as we explore this universe, and it, the, the universe is an invitation for exploration. So I invite you to be still, I invite you to be quiet, to be open, but also to go out there with an attitude of, let's explore, let's find out, both outward and inward. Thank you. <laughs>